Okay, perfect. So you're good. Um, what I have from Glenna, you know, who has been our facilitator for the past couple of weeks, um, is an agenda and is a note template. So I will take notes and I will tell you the agenda. And one of the things like, we're going to focus on probably the most heaviest is the notes from the September 5th meeting. So um, yeah, you should have them electronically. They're part of but I did bring them just in case okay. we can look at them. Sometimes I'm a hard copy kind of person. It's very, it's very <laughs> um, so I had these like for us to share. And um, basically, you know, the agenda today is um, to work on kind of crafting some recommendations and some thoughts around our topic area. Um, and we basically merged assist and preserve together because I think Sherry, you had preserve and Jake, you had assist. And you guys are the right ones who chose yeah. those. Yeah. So then we'll mush those together um, and uncover those. I think that's like that. I didn't look at is there a topic as much. Um, topic that's what you might, they might have been very specific. It's totally fine. Okay. Um, but that's kind of why we work together because only one person was in the each and we figured we might as well go ahead and work those together. And um, we'll basically just start kind of drafting some recommendations and looking at what people wrote down. There's a lot that folks wrote down from our last meeting. And we don't have to make recommendations only on what the group said, but just with some of the ideas that they have that we can incorporate into our document. Um, so, and I do have some like kind of prompting questions and whatnot that I will ask that'll help our conversation. Probably the biggest thing is we'll have to choose who is going to present for the group at the actual meeting you want. <laughs> the paper, rock, scissors, offer money. <laughs> uh, but it'll be, it'll be one of you. I'm just, I'm just a facilitator. I'm just saying, you know, this is going to be kind of your age of quarter to be crazy thought. So it does make sense that it should be one of you to present at the October meeting. Um, real quick, do you have, do you know, is there a Wi-Fi password or? Should be a public, you should be able to join Inglewood Public. Okay. I'll try. It says no internet. Yeah, I have trouble connecting mm. to those. So just to clarify, we're really focusing on the what, not the how, right? Like what are the things that are going to be put in place to assist the facilitation of this program to the public, mm -hmm. right? Not how we're going to implement those. Right. It's most of the what because um you know, the how is sometimes limited by maybe what kind of funds are available or, you know, what we'll gets free on the bridge. But I don't think if you have an idea on how, mm -hmm. I think we note take that and we still have that as part of maybe the presentation, right? Um, it, <laughs> the how might be not feasible, but I think we have to say we're looking for things of all the ideas that you guys have from. What you brought in so if there are some hows like let's take notes of those hows and get them and done i really want the conversation to be kind of as um open sort of free thinking as possible mm -hmm. so and this thing is kind of out of left field who knows maybe that's what actually will work for us they don't want you to feel like oh i know this is going to take thousands of dollars and i want to stress this or millions of dollars no let's go for it and see what what we have let me just quickly take a little bit of notes here. We're meeting in person. Today is September. And also, thank you guys for getting this on your calendars quickly. Sure. Oh, yeah. Thanks for uh, being flexible with the later yeah. meeting time. No problem. <laughs> I was gone most of next week, and I was like, oh, and then the second is here, the third. So I'm glad we were able to fit it in. Okay, so one of the things we do want to review before we start is our strategic vision. And I will just reiterate that if you don't remember. To ensure equitable access to affordable and diverse housing options for all residents of Inglewood, including seniors, low-income individuals, homebuyers, renters, and future generations, with a focus on those struggling to afford housing costs. Our goal is to create a sustainable housing ecosystem that fosters stability, encourages community investment, and contributes to the overall well-being of our diverse community. So thinking about that and thinking about our assist and preserve topic, 
Uh, so one of the first discussion questions are kind of the big discussion question is what do you believe are the highest leverage items that will move the city of Inglewood closer to the strategic vision within the lens of assisting and preserving affordable housing? And that's a big one. Well, <clears throat> um, yeah, I unfortunately didn't have a whole lot of time to, to sort of study or prepare as much as I as I wanted to. That's okay. You've been in all the meetings. That's yeah, I've been the most. Yeah, a lot of studying and preparing. There. Um, but yeah, I guess as far as um preserving, um, you know, I do think that's probably an important um component just because especially it seemed like the the first iteration of the code next kind of failed because a lot of people were um, especially concerned about sort of well especially the, the, the repeal of our own zoning um so i mean i guess i guess things that that have stuck out to me is is um on the preservation front is, is i guess like adus you know adus and cottage zone um seem like seem like things that uh, you know could could possibly increase uh, housing density without um and well and and also preserve the you know preserve some of the 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 bungalows that are that are mm -hmm. relatively affordable um so i think maybe that kind of answers your question mm -hmm. so if we were to kind of put a recommendation off of that, it would be really maybe encouraging um, encouraging the gentle density piece, right? Yeah. So not, and this can, and this really falls into preservation because it, one of the things I look at a lot, and I don't want to throw out any conversation, but I want to give a little bit of what I think to people. Well, you know, what has um, a lot of smaller multifamily properties. And I think you hit the you know, and when you talked about you know, things that were in the past or code next, or I guess people were scared or didn't want big developments, right? Big multifamily buildings to come in and you know take over all the single family homes. Um, but preserving gentle density by preserving maybe some of the smaller multifamily complexes, you probably know what I'm talking about if you drive around, okay. right? They're like 10, yeah. 12, they all have cute names okay. of like their moms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We looked at purchasing one a couple of years ago called the Corey Lynn, and that was yes. the owner's daughter, right? Yeah. Um, but that allows us to have some affordable housing and to do some preservation work that is still gentle, right? That still doesn't put a ginormous high price. So I think that um, that fits into kind of what you're talking about. Because in, I don't know how, you know, if the zoning would work, but I know some people want to buy those thinking that maybe someday they'll go tear it down and it's something huge. Yeah, so I, I guess the neighbors want no, yes. Right, and I, I guess the idea of what you're talking about is, um, uh, is is that the thing where, where a nonprofit or a housing authority would like buy the property and then, um, and then make it like life tech or something? You know, a couple of things. It could be that anybody buys it, like anybody in the open market just buys it, and if they get you know the proper zoning for it, they can maybe knock it down and add a couple more stories and make something. Newer and more expensive, right? It's not affordable. Um, a preservation technique that the city we could think about, and the city could think about, is some way to incentivize a nonprofit or a housing authority or any kind of other affordable housing entity to buy and preserve it. When I kind of talk about, we tried to buy this Corey Lynn, this is pre COVID, it was many years ago. Um, it was just expensive. Like we were literally just to outbid. And this is something where this where the city would need like to do this, right? Right. So you would do some to human device owners. Do you yeah. Uh, right. or yeah, could, could the city incent yeah, could the city somehow um yeah, incent I don't know, make it make it more um pencil out better for certain owners for oh, like only for nonprofits and and uh, uh people who would institute you know, like that or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe this, yeah. Because but I, I guess the roadblock I was hitting in my head was like, oh well, yeah, you know, where is the city going to get money to so, you know, fill the gap for the nonprofit developers and facilitate this kind of thing? But I guess maybe, right. some, yeah, some 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 fees they can waive or something for certain developers or something. Right. And yeah, I, I do I do think you know <clears throat> with the preservation 
thing. Um, you know, I, I, I think the the fear, the concern is as far as like the the first like iteration of code next. It was just sort of a, a big relaxing of the the building codes or, or zoning codes or whatever it was um was you know I, I think a lot of times anybody who opposed that gets bashed is like oh you're just you know an envy and you don't want right but 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 I but I think there's a lot of examples around England where something that costs three fifty you know a little bungalow that costs three fifty was replaced by things that cost you know one point two million a piece right and I you know I I happen to buy one of those little bungalows and it's not you know it's not a um, it's not a fancy house by any means. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's small yeah. and it's old and it doesn't have central AC or whatever, but at least I'm here and I'm raising my kids in it. Right, so right. I, you so, have those things to Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is, you know, do I necessarily want to live in an 80 year old house? I mean, not, it's not, not necessarily, but I'm not a millionaire. So, right. so I, but I do, yeah. So I, I wonder as far as um, keeping that scenario from, from happening where, uh, where, uh, Something that is, I guess, what they call it, naturally occurring. Portable housing. Or, yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know what, what what there is as far as preserving options, as far as just simply preserving those, other than maintaining some R one zoning or something. I mean, I, I right. I, I don't really know. Like I said, I, I didn't have a whole lot of time to um, to do a lot of research in, in advance of this, but I, I am wondering what what kind of um, what kind of uh, what kind of what kind of solutions there are to that that problem. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like, yeah, I do feel like the, the cottage zoning thing is really interesting, I think, because, um, you know, I think especially a lot of a lot of young families and stuff would really like some kind of yard, some kind of outdoor space. Right. And um, that is, is, as well as AEUs, I, I guess personally, I think that if, if, if I were in the market, I, I would rather uh, live on a small separate lot than like live in somebody's backyard, you know. So. Mm -hmm. And I think... One of the things we really haven't talked kind of enough about that you brought up, but I think we could really talk about a lot in some ownership. I feel like the conversation has all centered a lot about renters. And if I heard anything from folks in the task force and from community folks through Code Next, is preservation of home ownership opportunities. And so I, as you're talking about that, I'm like, I really think that's something we should kind of. I think you don't have to agree because <laughs> it's in your head. Um, but we need to also focus on home ownership where we should focus on. Oh, for sure. Because otherwise, just rent. Yeah, because yeah, I, I think a pretty typical arc is like, you know, at least what, what we did, you know, me and my wife, we, we lived in rentals for, for a pretty good long time. And once yeah. we, had, we had kids in a rental, and then we had a really strong desire to, to own something. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it wasn't going to be here, it would have to be somewhere else. So we think we agree with that. So if we were going to think about how we would preserve like naturally occurring affordable housing, home ownership, like preserving kind of those the rings or you know, cottages, what, what do you think that would look like? What kind of program or how would we ask the city to do that? I mean, zoning is definitely like an option, right? Saying, hey, this is a part that's just not zoned for the fancy duplex. Are there any other tools? And that kind of thing, that kind of always goes to look into the assist. When you think about assisting with home ownership, would um, like a down payment assistance program work or like a land trust kind of thing? Land trust is tricky because you really have to be the facilitator of that land trust to make it work. You know, it's a long term hold, it's something that is a nonprofit. It's really you have to be in the business of running that land trust and working on the deed and managing the restrictions right. and then being the second on that mortgage <laughs> yeah. for every property or the first. I'm sorry, the lender's second. Um, things so can you break? <laughs> just be freaking talking. Talk about home ownership, right? And that's not a whole other thing. And Inglewood. Again, has historically been known to have some naturally occurring affordable home ownership options, like little cottages, cottages little bungalows um, that we're seeing not necessarily go for home ownership when they're sold. They're getting scrapped in the duplex, maybe in a triplex if the lot's big enough. Um, and that's something I think the group has talked about home ownership support. So, how else could we 
So I do have um, preserve or assist well, the family. I was thinking actually one of the high items that the city could do, as I talked about the original question, but um, for as far as home ownership, I did have work on partnerships with the city and the bank for grants and document assistance and then low interest loans for developers even um, to kind of incentivize the development within the city. I also think a potential sales tax on um, the sale of non owner occupied transfer tax or a, um, what do they call that? When somebody sells the home, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess that is the transfer tax. Okay. Tell me more about that. So it would just be like a higher tax rate for non owner occupied property. So it incentivizes you to either sell it when you own it, right? We do not have to pay that extra mm -hmm. transfer fee or tax. And if you're um, going to sell it affordably, would you be like better incentivized? I mean that you know they they say that there is no affordable housing without some kind of subsidy. Mm -hmm. So it, it would have to be subsidized, right? You would have to incentivize people to do that, and that would take money either way. So I don't know. Is that where they would get taxed if they sold it for the developer? No, it's basically like if it's not if they if, so you own house in England, you decide to move out of it instead of selling it, and you keep it as a rental. When you go to sell that because it wasn't your primary residence. And you're making an income and not living here, you pay a tax on yourself. Okay, so if you first you convert it to a rental and then you sell it yeah. sometime later. Right. And then you'd have a tax on it. And if you sold it as your primary residence, then you don't. Okay. Does the city have a this might be another question? Does the city have like a like a list or a registry of which which properties are rental? I mean, I can pull that from the uh, public records. <laughs> All I do is run a search and click a non owner occupied box. And anybody who has a mailing address that's not their post or their. That's how you figure that out? Uh -huh. Interesting. I mean, they register. So your mortgage is typically registered as whether it's primary or not. And then, mm -hmm. um, yeah, whether you live in the, the public records knows all that. <laughs> So, pretty, and so that's why you would is like 58% non owner occupied. It is primarily non owner occupied properties. We have a huge transiency problem within the schools. We have, you know, just, well, I just, I know, but it's, it's, it's spirals, right? It's right. It's spirals. It's spirals. It's spirals. So when people yeah. rent versus owning, then it, it creates this unstable environment all around. And not that renting is bad. I mean, it's a great stepping stone. We couldn't have those. And we do, have everyone's going to be able to rent some point there. Right, you know, when you're 20, you don't buy a house. Right, exactly. So we want to encourage that as well, but um, you don't. You want to encourage people not to be the stepping stone to their investment portfolio. Right. Oh, that's what Inglewood's become. <laughs> Interesting. Dick, how do you feel about that? Because you live in Inglewood, and you're a How do you feel about? I think it's no, I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I don't buy it when when people are passing that cost onto the renters and say, "Yeah, sure, the renters are the market there." You know, right. so. All, all that, but no, I, I think that'd be some interesting. Yeah, I guess the other thing I wonder is how easy it would be for people to weasel out of it, you know, to, to I don't know, mm -hmm. you know to, to, to pretend they live there full time or to, mm -hmm. uh, right. or whatever. I mean, I feel like Title can figure most of that stuff out. Who, sorry? Title company. Oh, yeah. So it's almost. To me, I think this, this, right, this idea kind of saddles our topics of like assistant preserve, right? Because if we can preserve more housing for actual owner occupied folks, right? Instead of it being renters or uh, even like Airbnbs, right? Creating more owner occupied opportunities. Well, goodbye, right? Mm -hmm. In theory, if you're saying it's someone's second home, we'd love that to be someone's first home, mm -hmm. right? And that's how it becomes that naturally. A natural occurring right. affordable housing, you're not hanging onto it for 20 years outside of your ownership window. Right. And we're pres or preserving the structure of it when they're right, right, right. not selling it to a um, developer. Mm -hmm. But then we're talking about maybe finding some way to incentivize or assist that person in selling it. I don't know. Well, and then we can invest in we can assist the person in buying it through the grants and the TPA right. grants. And so we're kind of, I mean, 
I almost wonder if the if there could possibly be like a I don't know, I've heard about what the right first refusal by the city where the city can have the chance to I think it's the thing to them to purchase the yeah property and, or and then there is some confusion with the with the law um because it only applies to current like affordable housing contracts. So it doesn't actually apply to things like after recurring affordable housing. It's if you, you know, use Glide Tech or some other uh, affordable housing fund to develop that property, then in theory, the right of first refusal has to go to the government. That's my understanding of it because it's not only because when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's right. Uh, and <laughs> they tried to make it more broad, um, but it got knocked down in the Senate. Like it, didn't, it only yeah. applies to affordable housing now. Um, so Back to that original thing, though, of like the bigger picture of like how, because I worked on people things for assists. Um, my first thing is to identify who the programs and incentives are intended to assist. The key groups, so I have like developers, renters, homeowners, the homeless, businesses, future generations, and seniors. Because those are kind of our, I know that's a lot. Just... No, but I think that's a great point um, because. Traditionally, so when I talked about assisting from the housing authority's perspective, we're assisting low income folks, 50% mm -hmm. AMI and below. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's some programs, the affordable housing programs, where it's not really assistance, for example, the rent of the license program is lower and they can do, you know, 80% AMI and below. Um, and that is, when you saw that, that's the renter, that's the person. Mm -hmm. Do we, I think the conversation can talk about do we expand that to more? Um, one of the recent housing studies that came out talks about that more folks in the middle class are experiencing housing um, rent being rent burden and house burden mm -hmm. more than we even more than we thought. That it's not traditionally a low income problem. It's at so many more levels, absolutely more income levels. Um, but you just pointed out all these other groups, and I'm like, do we? Also, with this other groups. I guess I mean, it's bigger than. Right, we want to attract developers, right? So, we're going to have programs created of that. And then we want to support and stabilize renters, um, encourage home ownership through DPA programs, support the homeless population through mm -hmm. different types of. Um, and then businesses we want to retain and attract, so we don't want to go crazy with commercial leakage fees. <laughs> um, but how do, we, how do we retain them while still supporting? Funding this. Right. And then um, future generations, I have a preserve and land banking. And then seniors, that's going to be our biggest population mm -hmm. very soon. Well, let's talk about what it looks like to maybe assist um, assist renters. Let's, all these people, we'll start there. That's kind of the easiest. Um, what do you think? What does that look like for you guys? So, what does my deal recommendation look like when it comes to assisting? And what kind of renters? So obviously incentivizing developers to create more affordable homes. You know, but actually the, the margin of renters that need help is that really low in the, the 30 to 50 percent AMI, right? 30 to 80. Um yeah. To 80 of the renters. So like I feel like yeah, so we need really subsidized housing. Because we have only 801 unit gap as of 20 for the greater than 50 percent AMI, but the below 30 percent AMI was like 1500 unit gap. Mm -hmm. But the biggest, and then for housing for sale, it was the 80 to 100 percent, 120 percent AMI. So there are different needs and different different income brackets and different. Right. So maybe we think about a recommendation. It's a recommendation that somewhat different for folks that have different AMIs, like for homeowners, you know, for folks that have an AMI maybe in higher who want to be homeowners. Our assist looks like partnership with the bank, partnership with bank, down payment, or interest grants from the city for teachers or for yeah. public services. Dick, what are some of your thoughts? I see you brewing. So, I see thinking happening. Um, <laughs> uh, um, well, I, uh, yeah, I know there was, I know at least during the last co next discussions of the, the council, it seemed like there was a lot of question about whether to incentivize or mandate, you know, affordable units or mm -hmm. and stuff. And, um, uh, 
I just heard the word incentivize. I I I I do think, and I think this this is sort of supported by the policy documents and stuff. That yeah. they, they were saying something that that incentives often don't deliver nearly as many portable units as if they're optional, because or what is yeah, the if they're that? optional, yeah. yeah, or or if it's like oh, we'll give you a little less parking requirement if you do mm -hmm. this and that. But so they're saying like that might incentivize people in certain areas, but in the transit oriented district, that's already waived. It's just not going to incentivize reducing the parking requirements. Is it going to incentivize them to add those units in that area? Yeah. And yeah. it's something that's new for next year for transit oriented. Um, yeah, I think, I, well, I, I just, I just think if, if, I don't know if there is some, if there does and end up being some kind of age over or something, but it should mm -hmm. be mandatory. Um, you know, and sometimes I think some of those incentives aren't great for rolled around the, the, the building. You know, I mean, I, I, I do think the the lowering of parking requirements and stuff can, can make life mm -hmm. harder for neighbors sometimes. Well, maybe this goes to, you know, the initial conversation of you guys say what you'd want to see, but not how. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're talking about providing assistance so that folks at the lower AMI service and lower have more less expensive units and homeowners have more or the people want to foray into home ownership at the higher AMIs get into home ownership and city council or community development, you figure out how to make that work. <laughs> so well, maybe that, you know, we're talking about incentives and maybe that's the tool, but we want to see that outcome. Maybe it's up to somebody else to figure out the tool, right? And there's a really interesting study that just came out with the numbers about how Denver's mandatory inclusionary zoning policy has stifled their development applications compared to Aurora, who they went the way of increasing permitting times and decreasing zone zoning density or increasing zoning density allowance. Um, and it's the permits in Aurora were significantly higher than the permits in Denver in the same time frame after this requirement. And so it's interesting because Longmont said it was working for them. So I would be interested to hear. So I think you, there's a couple of things. I don't, I like Peter, his study is flawed. Yeah. Um, it's also been taken down off the site. I don't know. Oh, no, you know one that came off in, in August. Yes, in oh. August. Um, but goes back, but what he said was kind of in direct um, contradiction to Molly. Mm -hmm. Once again, there's differing opinions. Mm -hmm. But Molly said very much so that when you look at studies on IHO, they ought, they instantly have a dip the minute they're insured. Mm -hmm. And to me, when I looked at the data on Denver, it was like, oh, there's so many confounding factors. You've got coming out of a pandemic, you've got high interest rates, you've got high development costs. Like to me, it's hard to isolate that in the IHO it was the only policy intervention mm -hmm. that brought this result. But you also have exactly what Molly said. Because also permits spiked mm -hmm. before the policy went into play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the conversation, if we have a, we talk about the IHO. Right? No, Molly's from the policy. So there's Molly from Longmont and Molly from the policy. Okay. Molly from the policy pointed out that when you look at a longer time frame of an mm -hmm. IHO coming into effect, you will see this, this spike in this dip, and then you will see back to normal. Okay. So that's what I thought. Yeah. That's when I saw Peter's work. I was like, ooh, I don't think you let this slide well, long enough. Well, I'm that there's no that's but it's like you mean it works, right? It doesn't mean it's like it's too long. Well, I'm, I'm leery of, of like, you know, it always seems like council have, has the temptation to like, or I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of made anxious by by the the idea of competing with other cities and, and kind of wants to be almost uh, the uh, just requirements in the metro area or something just to make sure right. that they don't go building somewhere else. And it's like, well, I don't know. I, I don't, if, you, if, you, if they come here and build unhelpful things, then, you know, <laughs> we, we don't want that. I mean, right. yeah, right. I, 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 I think, I, I think so. I think it makes sense because we don't have the land to also take that linkage fee and hold on to it to buy later. We don't have yeah. all these options. That's a little bit of the problem of comparing where we're in Denver too. Mm -hmm. Aurora has a lot bigger pieces of land, mm -hmm. which also makes me think about how much work um, Peter Southern Authority has been able to do. They just continue to go up north. Is that in, in, oh, no, no. It's Adams County. Mm -hmm. And so those are just, which is wonderful, but <laughs> there's single one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I, I, feel, I feel like so many, like, uh, the ship has sailed on a lot of these 
things that are going up now that, that are all market rate, you know. Right. So it's, it's just too bad. It's it's just, yeah, it's too. Because I, I, I don't you know where else. Kind of music yeah, ones. I feel like, feel like, feel like, feel like all the, um, yeah, the potential places to build are already getting built. And here we are. Right, and we're not going to get anything from those. So I'm thinking yeah. about an IA show. But things will be redeveloped and they'll continue. And, yeah. and we're going to do the whole, they're going to do the whole city center. So right. I think there's that opportunity. Where the, yeah. the power tree was. And mm -hmm. and One of the other things that I have too is that um, I would love to see them support the code next approved items already. Um, work on their ADU process, streamlining that potentially with modular. Green Age design plans like San Diego's done. You're really like, getting into the building, Sherry. Well, <laughs> we're like, no, but this is assisting, like, incentivizing people assisting to do, in the building, right? assisting people to do, encourage right. things that they've already passed. Okay. Right? Because you, right, Jen dropped out of her, her ADO. Her ADO. Did you watch that? No. Uh -huh. Oh, she went to city council on Monday to talk about it. Okay. One of our um, housing authorities uh, is in sitting with a city of New York residents. And um, he was super excited about doing an ADU and like got the home equity loan and started the process and blah, blah, blah. And figured out that part of the permitting process requires um, uh, the hiring of a general contractor. And the general contractor fees are just too much. So it's like you can't, it can't be like a homeowner led type of development. There has to be that professional to pull the permits and everything. So she's like, I'm not, now I can't afford. To do an ADU that's even somewhat affordable, that rents have to be crazy on the ADU to pay for all of it. So she went and kind of gave that feedback to council, like she's literally not building an ADU. Well, in Salt Lake City has done things effectively with modular, where they have basically created designs that are pre approved and you can put them in place and they're thriving with their ADUs. And San Diego has done a predetermined list of designs that you can have built so you don't have to start. Mm -hmm. But like to work on the things that they've already approved or like incentivize developers to do cottage houses, make some kind of program around that. And the you know, recommendation about ADUs to begin fits into the assist, right? Assist in building more because ADU well, because it's the program yeah. that, that connects the public to this development or to this affordable housing. And I think Getting people to build what they've already passed would help that. And I know that's built, but like assisting them mm -hmm. to encourage them to do it, right? Like that's the programs that they should. On the assist thing, I think I, yeah. Um, so, wait, am I right in remembering we like applied for CHAPA money but didn't get it? Thank you. The Prop 123 still not thinking, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the thing where we show a commitment to increase affordable housing by 3% a year or something in expedited review process. Then um, we get grants that can be put toward, they can be given to like nonprofits to build stuff. Is that right? How do you get into $23 yeah. work? Um, is that once your jurisdiction opts in and makes the commitment? Anybody who's building affordable housing or trying to do land banking, whether it be the city as an entity or a nonprofit or the housing authority, gets access to the Prop 123 funding streams. Uh, and to continue to have access to those funding streams, you have to hit that 3% threshold every single year. And if you don't, after three years, you, the, your whole jurisdiction, anybody who wants to build in your jurisdiction does not get access to those funds for like a year or two. So it hasn't managed to hit 3%, so you don't get funding or Oh, we have three years. So in theory, it's three percent every year, but you basically have to do nine percent in three years. Um, and I mean Nancy probably know a little bit better. I don't know if we're gonna if we're gonna hit it. Um, because it like Trails of the House, the newer development was too kind of like I just too soon. They were um, permitted before Prop 123, the commitment period started. Um, it's a loophole. It's like it contributes to that. It song. contributes. Like they're done, and they yeah. have a certificate of occupancy in that the window. Like to me, it should be like when people move in. That's when that counts, right? And then, um, um, yeah, and people start paying for that. Yeah, right. And I don't know. Kind of to your point of seeing a lot of development going up. I don't. I don't know much else affordable that's going up. So I don't know if we're going to hit it because we have to do like a hundred and gosh, I put it in that letter we talked about. Um, 140, do you know offhand? 170, yeah. 123, but it's like 100, it's 100 plus. 
units? Yeah. Okay. I mean, they sell it every year, right? But that's a big total 90%. I mean, they feel like we, we, we need this mandatory inclusionary zoning policy before those numbers would be difficult to ascertain. What's that? In order to get put on the Yeah. We would have to require from everybody building. Right. Because um, if you would have, if you would have had Cherry House at Lee How, like that would have been 82 units. Right. That's and that right. would have been a really nice, like, mm -hmm. boost. But, um, even if we had maybe inclusionary, you know, some housing options, people had to leave. And developers had to build like five or 10 affordable units for the development. It would still take like 10, 12 developments. Yeah. So it's, um, mm -hmm. I think it's a <coughs> metric for landlocked jurisdictions like our state. Maybe it's, with the transit oriented zoning, though, if they did have that in place, the mandatory, well, I don't know if it's automatically. Mandatory for now, now for that zoning. I know. They they looked at the zoning restrictions within certain miles of the public yeah. transit stations, um, and I think you have to include affordable mm -hmm. for that zoning work lift because you can build up to forty units per acre now. Okay. Um, in transit oriented. Well, I'm sure that's going to apply for this area. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly this. Yeah. It's just one of those things. And I think that we can kind of start our conversation back on this is that development takes time. Mm -hmm. So I refer back to Carol's that we have because uh, the Housing Authority in all transparency is a special limited partner. Um, we have like a 0.01% stake in the building. So we don't manage, operate anything. We're basically a silent partner. But with our um, partnership, we give some tax and nonprofit tax breaks to Charles Bay. So they can make everything work and keep it affordable because they are not paying property taxes and sales and use tax. Um, but they came to us to do this development where they did it in 2020. Um, and I want to say it was July of 2020. And we saw people actually getting their heads in beds in June of 2024. Wow. So I like that we're talking about building a little bit, but if we're thinking about maybe short term strategies for assisting and preserving, mm -hmm. it's not built. So no, I that think it's like supporting the types of building that's happening is really what I'm saying, like creating the programs to support the direction of the builds in the future as an assist. So that we don't have to go back to the people and ask for zoning variances right away. We can focus on what we have mm -hmm. in place. Um, and build density that way. Because they do have some the density allowances in these zones mm -hmm. that are too difficult to build or too yeah. expensive to build. So we could fix, I guess. Um I also have like the idea of creating an affordable housing committee um, to support and implement the efforts if get the community involved um to continue the conversation if something doesn't work we could go back and work on it you know they could go back and work on it um so kind of that idea from the last meeting mm -hmm. where we talked about taking the task force or something like the task force and making um, mm -hmm. committee mm -hmm. Well, how like a board? Yeah. How do um how does down payment assistance work? Is that is this something where there are grants out there or something? The city would fund it essentially yeah. at like three thousand dollars to a homeowner who applied or has like a tight Englewood or works in Englewood, lives in Englewood, and wants to buy, then they would get this grant essentially, which could be. The way Chapa does it is it's a second on the mortgage, so it's a zero interest loan that pays for their down payment, and then it's repaid out of the proceeds of closing. And so there's no interest on it. It's just a second on the mortgage. Um, if you refinance, you pay it back too. So that's kind of is. Okay. But I think it's you drop it after five years, or it's forgivable after five years. So where does that where does that money come from? It would be the fact that you a funded source. So like we would have to do some kind of levy, some kind of. Uh, Maybe it should be something to fund it. That's the how. That's yeah. Not the word. <laughs> <laughs> Which we can't. But I mean, you know, if we've got an idea that we're not sure the how, I think that's something we can figure out. Maybe here. 
but it's interesting. Like, right. Right. Well, like, I don't even know how, but right. Right. <laughs> either way, it is. I mean, that, that's kind of the hard part is when we're talking about, when we're doing all of this work and talking about recommendations, we're talking about things that the market has not fixed on. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do something different to the market. And a lot of the times that is just money. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the hardest, that's the hardest piece, right? Well, yeah, I just, I wonder if there is, if there is, um, if it would make sense, I know that, we, that this was talked about in the last meeting, if, uh, for there to be like a full time staff member whose whole job is to go out and look, right. for, look for money. I just don't know if, there's, <laughs> if, if they would be having Fund money yourself, find money for your own job and find money for the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually, it's actually, it's actually yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, you're starting a whole business because that is such an important piece of making all of these recommendations work is to find the money. And that's clearly value. So I think. You know, putting that, that's a part of the assistant preserve. How do we do any of this if there is not one person at the, at the city or two or three who are dedicated to this? I know everyone in community development is so, is so busy and has lots of things going on. And it's hard to find money if that feel like when we have job mm -hmm. Well, and I think really it's, you know, you look at the at council site and you can see that it's on the developer. There are so many different sources of funding. There's state, local, there's federal, state, and local funding. And so, and it changes every year. Next year, yeah. we have two new sources of funding with the transit yeah. and the housing. Is this the kind of thing where if somebody can just find the time to fill up paperwork, then it's possible to get the money? It is, but it's it's a lot of paperwork. Right. Right? And it's really complex. Timing lines and, yeah. yeah. And I think the other thing, too, is um, it is, a, it is definitely a capacity, a huge limited capacity, but also there are a lot of the programs that are uh, competitive. Mm -hmm. So even if we have somebody filling out the applications and we not get it, that said, there's still so much, I think, value in somebody who puts the application together, does all the work, and maybe gets rejected, but you know next time maybe what you need to do different. Mm -hmm. or, and sometimes, with some, especially the Prop 123 dollars, people weren't rejected because they're Proposals weren't good. Mm -hmm. They're just too good. <laughs> well, and then and then also like if you get rejected from one, you've got several applications in the queue, so you're not just relying on all the work that you put into your Prop 123 application. You've also got right. this and this and this potentially, because I mean in Chaka site you can plug in your type of project and it gives you this list of funding sources that it's an or so like your yeah your project matches one qualification of those funding sources, but you really have to comb through and know what all the details are to really know if your project matches. It's a lot of work. So I think that's actually it's a great recommendation because you guys have talked about so many different like programs we could do to assist and preserve. Mm -hmm. Who's going to do that? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important question. Mm -hmm. I don't think Nancy wants to do it all. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going to be person in community development. She knows she does everything. Um, <laughs> but you know, just that idea, so we don't want to add more work with someone else. I think that idea of being dedicated and really knowing about it is very complex. It's not my favorite. Thing. And there's only a few. And I see you know, the, right. the details. Like, Let's see. What else? We go back and look at um, our question. Oh, we, another thing we talked about for um, it's. It's kind of preserve and this, but um, like an incentive program for land donation and sales to the city. So creating some kind of um, vacant land tax or um, really focusing in on those vacant properties and creating um, either a land banking incentive or a donation incentive for those properties. Yeah, I mean, that would be interesting if the city could somehow buy lots like that and donate them. Mm -hmm. Or like if the owner would get a tax break, uh, it may not have a tax break for donating it to the city, and the city could just hold it for right. that in purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's not a vacant property, I thought that was in. Well, you know, in my line of work, I meet a lot of folks in all the districts we work in. Um, you know, Willis Sheridan and I'm corporate director of Honey, who are like really benevolent good people and want to rent to our subcommittee folks or want to just kind of know what they can do. Um, 
I think we could find people in the city who'd be interested in like, hey, maybe I'm going to sell my house. I'd rather sell it to a land trust or sell it to the city to preserve or to put into an affordable home ownership program. How would we create? I and mean, I know I said do the how, but I wonder like how difficult we could create something like that. And what does it look like to pull to the heartstrings of people who want to do something good? Is it a big task? But I feel like that's a, that's a housing, affordable housing committee task yeah. potentially. They reach out to these big and then Mm -hmm. owners and they target identify what are the opportunities well, I feel like there, yeah i feel like there'd have to be some kind of uh concrete reward or something. i mean i think that has to right yeah yeah i mean i i, I think it's people who are looking to sell right. houses I, I think who would who would take a smaller offer from the, from the city or, the, or, mm -hmm. or whatever the boring yeah profit rather than yeah. some developer i think this would be for pretty well, but if the city's willing to pay for it plus get a tax break, maybe yeah. not the full market value, but you they're getting it at a discounted rate with mm -hmm. the tax break, potentially people might be a little more open to it, especially if it's vacant. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and like you're talking about the preservation of Eaglewood and you're you're talking to people who've owned this land for a long time and they probably haven't sold it to a developer intentionally. Right, um, because that's why like, developers are circling all the vacant lots in the city. Yeah, I mean, they call them door. I just see them as like with a crows or anything, it's like circling the top of the land. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just think that, yeah, the fact that, that in my mind would be something that would be like, a, like the historical preservation society, right? Their goal is to reach out to these properties and right. try to preserve them. And I feel like that would be the goal of a task force also. Mm -hmm. and, to create these land opportunities for the city. I, I wonder if it would be at all worth exploring the, the uh, you know, having people vote on like a, like a tax site, the, the property tax site, something, I don't know. I mean, that's how you assistant preserve, right? Because you have a pot of money to offer assistance to do this preservation work. I get the parks paid for first. <laughs> then we'll test that money. <laughs> Um, I think that's an interesting one. This one is definitely one of the things Rep. Hope County is putting forth is a small uh, county tax increase to pay for the gap in funding they have for some of their services. Um, taxes are interesting. Well, and that's another thing that I thought the chat the committee would be responsible for is that tri city relationship. Yep. Um, potentially, uh, Working on that tri city initiative to create some kind of affordable housing goals with other municipalities mm -hmm. instead of just being evil on its own. Like, working with each other. We have this like platform to work with other people. So, yeah. you, have, you have some kind of partnership with Sheridan? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For homeless. Oh. You need to work up all our things. Um, and I'm not going to remember all of my hand, but I know there's a couple different IGAs for different services uh, between the three cities, just depending on what it is or the cost of it. But yes, in terms of homelessness, there's a Tri Cities policy group that has an action plan and has put money for it to have someone who coordinates the action plan and tries to coordinate homelessness kind of outreach and services and programs amongst the three so that we're tackling that kind of problem together. Um, and in all transparency, I sit in on the policy group, and it's a really interesting model. And it's an interesting model to think about not just homelessness, but housing, because of how you know, kind of interconnected the communities are. They have some of the same struggles with not having lands and having the same, um, you know, no longer homeless for first-time home buyers, no options for seniors to, you know, downsize into and create some. Um, so it's indefinitely, I'm, I'm adding it to that person that we're going to hire as being part of their job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that the recommendation things. that that person would also focus on, like the regional, mm -hmm. a regional approach. Yeah, that's great. Um, one of the, the biggest needs of the root policy address was the starter homes price near or below $300,000. Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking that if they focused on those ADUs and cottage zoning incentives to build those, that would help create those homes priced under 300000 because it's going to take that separate 
they approved the lot splitting, right, for mm -hmm. the R1, so you could build a smaller house on 1,800 square feet. There's just, there's opportunities that they could create that specific, fill that specifically by focusing on those things. Yeah, I, can I guess that I kind of let the kind of zoning thing, because I, I just feel like uh, even at the, because I, I think, what was his name, Hugo, or whatever mm -hmm. it was? Was talking about how you could build a two story, 1200 square foot house, you know, uh, which is bigger than my house, but all, all, a lot of people wouldn't want to, uh, probably wouldn't want to raise it. Maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know, how many fit was that three bedrooms? Maybe? Well, then if you've got 1200, you could easily do, I mean, definitely smaller rooms, right? Then that's this idea of the cube and the primary suits or whatnot. We could at least do three bedrooms and a good living space downstairs. Um, but maybe, you know, okay, you're talking about raising a family. Maybe that's not necessarily the homes where families get raised, per se, or maybe smaller families get raised, but creating, but it creates that pipeline. That middle housing. That middle housing, housing right there. Maybe that's something you buy. And then you trade it up. And that, right. Yeah. And it creates that equity, right? You're, you're paying off the mortgage, you're paying mm -hmm. the market appreciation, you're, you have something to invest in something else. Yeah, I, I do feel like I, I, I can think of a good number of examples of people who like, had kids in Inglewood and had them here when they were really little, and then like right. some were ready to get a bigger house for cheaper, under things, some way that solve that problem or something. I mean, I, I remember that in the in the latter days of the Code Next uh, drama, the they were they were talking about you know fourplexes where one one uh, unit would have to be accessible to X A and R. Hundred percent of any money or below. I, yeah, yeah, I thought eighty was great. I mean, eighty, 80 would have been like a, I think it's a two bedroom for like three hundred fifty thousand dollars or something. Which yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, this is this was a hundred percent of AMI still for that fourplex though, and that's not unreasonable. You know, I think that that would be something that a developer could hit, and it wouldn't create this really low income situation in the residential areas either. I well, I don't think 80%. I mean, I don't, I don't think 80%. I don't think 80%. I don't think 80%. And we have really high AMI. That's a thing for a number yes. two, right? That's like right. 100% yeah. AMI for a family four. And that's 132 yeah. now. So, like we're, we're 60. Yeah, my family's right around 60. Mm -hmm. which, to me, which to me is just something. Like, we're doing all right. I don't know. I mean, right. We, we, you're doing all right, but you're technically then classified in like this group. Right. Like, the idea that I think we talk about this in Inglewood that we have we do have such a high AMI is that yeah. It, and then it lends itself to be the more inclusive. Well, and then that, that is where, where yeah, sometimes I kind of really struggle to swallow it stuff or like like let's do this for 120% AMI. Just like that number is huge. You know? that, that is like a lot of money. I mean, for a family of four, 120 AMI would be like 160, 170. Yeah, yeah. And in theory, that's supposed to be if you're able to do it on your own, right? I mean, those two seventy-five thousand dollars salaries, really. That's yeah, one. Yeah, that's and that puts you over actually. <laughs> so if you make seventy-five thousand dollars, both of you, you're over that AMI, and you don't qualify. And that's really what's happening with that eighty percent. Because I work with eighty percent AMI right now, and you get two people in a household, and it's just a couple. That number is like seventy-nine thousand dollars for two people income. It's hard for if two people make forty five thousand dollars they're struggling for each right and, but they don't qualify for the sport housing opportunity because they make just over that yeah and so that inclusive number yeah. and increasing that has for my project i can't sell it at 80 percent AMI because everybody makes just it it's really tough like we're sitting at not even 50 percent sold since september mm -hmm. because people can't call yes and it's not for lack of interest it right really isn't it? it's just with the qualifications are tough. And Corey's product uh, with Habitat is even tougher because their numbers are more strict. Right. So it's. Yeah, well, yeah, I wonder if it could be. Yeah. So the, the subsidies are there for the. the yeah. But thinking kind of back to the strategic vision, right, is where we've made a value in, um, in helping everybody, right? And mm -hmm. having different. Um, Different ingredients and with or, or different assistance or different kinds of groups. Um, just don't forget about that, right? But I think it's important to looking at the study that we identified it's the 30% AMI and below for renters, right? 80% higher for um, 
for home ownership because that was the biggest need. But there's just a lot of need. You asked about renters too. One of the things that I had down was a, like a eviction protection, some kind of fund for eviction protection assistance. Yeah. And that's a good, that's good assistance. Because that's um, something that was on Fort Collins ballot that didn't get funded recently. <laughs> was their homelessness support fund and then also their rental thirty thousand dollars for rental eviction um assistance and that did not pass. But they did pass a fund for new AI. So those were coming. For what? <laughs> for AI uh research like an AI department or something. So that's what the Okay, let's fund the computers and not that to people. Yeah. I follow this <laughs> group called the MB and it's for Colin Yes in my backyard. Yeah, the EMB. Yeah, so they posted about these dollars that didn't get funded, but AI got funded. And uh, so that family self-sufficiency program, is that only for people in the voucher program? Or is that something that could be expanded? So that's a, that's a good question, because as you're talking about like eviction prevention and whatnot, you know, what we tend to see with eviction folks um, is there's definitely the folks who um, have hit them with a hard time, right? You've had an unexpected bill and that's why they're bringing in the rent. But then we're seeing a lot of people with more consistent every single month they can't make it work. Right? And that's to me a more systemic issue than I mean, just a lot of time. Um, so I think this idea of like, putting together maybe something or thinking about like a way to create a self-sufficiency program, what Sherry is referring to, and I think I talked about it briefly when I did that presentation, is that in our voucher program, we have a HUD funded program that's kind of a complementary program to the voucher holders to um be part of our self-sufficiency efforts, and then they get um, a little bit of escrow, they can save money. And so in theory, after five years in the program, they'll have this escrow account that had is funded that they could use to, we used to say use to buy house, but it's now at this point, like because there is no starter homes, you know, no good entry point, at least in this area, it doesn't work well. But the folks will use it sometimes to like buy a car, so then they can drive to work because that's what the parents say. Um, but the idea is in the five years is in addition to the escrow, they develop self-sufficiency skills that maybe if they still need a voucher to help, they can keep their voucher. Um, they just know how to plan for emergencies, maybe save a little bit, like have some of those skills that sometimes folks don't. We don't learn from mom and dad, we don't learn in school. Um, and actually, we talk about it, Prop 123 has a tenant equity vehicle to do it. You know, the, it's a similar concept, and I haven't flushed it out totally yet. But that if you're going to have a Prop 123 dollars to do your development, you have to have some sort of self sufficiency equity thing for your renter. Yeah, it's, right. it's, um, it's for the equity, it's for the, it's not only the need, but it's for the, um, oh, the equity. But you're basically you're getting one of your loans. You have to have a tenant equity vehicle to do it. But they will fund it. You don't have to fund it on your own. Um, I'm such a nerd. Such a nerd. Thank you. <laughs> so, it's one of those. Um, but it's an interesting concept, right? Because it gives, in theory, it's giving folks the tools and also some money to maybe get out of the cycle of maybe continuing to rent or continuing to struggle to rent. I don't know. I think when we talk about it, or yeah, some kind of tenant equity yeah. vehicle that the city could set up for, I don't know. Because one of the things, you know, required the big picture that folks are talking about when we don't have home ownership opportunities is you're not creating equity, right? Like just being a homeowner, you have equity. Even if you do nothing for 20 years, you're sitting on some equity. Folks who continue to rent don't have that. And the tenant equity vehicle, what it does is it essentially puts some percentage of their rent into an equity fund for them. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so because they are the for rent housing and then they yeah. this subsidy, they're creating this fund and putting some of that money in it for them. What do you think that would look like for, like how do you think that program might look like? We were going to recommend it. A little, not a little bit, not the whole, just a little bit of like, what would it really look like? I mean, maybe like the 3%. That's what, Prop 123 is right, 3% tenant equity vehicle. So 3% of their rent gets put in some kind of. I think it's like an annual. Um, let's see. 
but this is contingent on them taking all these courses and so. As far as I know, Prop 123 doesn't have contingent on courses. Our program is kind of contingent. It's not even a taking course, but it's, it's on kind of achieving your goals. Every person in our program with our family self-sufficiency um, creates their own, um, like, creates their own goals. And it can be anything from maybe if they hadn't finished high school to, like, getting a new DVD or anything along those lines, but they create them themselves. So we kind of let folks self-define self-sufficiency because it really looks different for um, and then they might take classes or courses to get there. Oh, okay. to get um, okay. For the tenant equity program, I don't think Prop 123 has any, um, I don't think there's any requirement for the tenants to do anything but live in the U.S. Oh, so it's on their equity program, not their position. It's on the security debt, too. Is it? Okay. But yes. it says, let's see, um, tenant equity vehicle will be established and administered to benefit the rest of the developments or receive equity financing. A thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars per year for residents. So they salvage it all. And I believe when they leave the unit, they get that out of money. Thousand dollars a year. To fifteen, yeah, I thought it was fifteen hundred dollars a year. I mean, that's that's a deposit on a new place, you yeah. know. Whether it's, it's something. Yeah. I think yeah. that you know, you're you're. I do yeah, I do feel like there's, I do feel like down payment assistance would be huge if, if that was something the city was able to offer. I mean, then they might be able to do it in partnership with like local private banks where the bank could mm -hmm. do some kind of lower interest loan for the city to offer that money. Like, because it, it, it could be a loan from the city that's attached to the mortgage through the bank mm -hmm. as a relationship, mm -hmm. you know. I think of <laughs> Chapa does it really well. Right. And again, we don't think about the how, but this mm -hmm. idea that if you know we value home ownership and we value making home ownership affordable, we in terms of assisting, we want the city to figure out a way to assist people to get into affordable homes. Mm -hmm. Y'all figure it out. That person figures out figures <laughs> it out. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we have some ideas, and of course, we can integrate those into the recommendations. Um, and I think that's what we're going to grow on, right? Is we're going to yeah. find some recommendations that everybody can come to the like a general consensus. consensus. <laughs> and then we're going to work on like what are the recommendations behind those few items. I think that's kind of the, mm -hmm. the trickle down over time. Well, I mean, I looked at the notes that from you know last time, and there are just pages and pages of really good recommendations. Like this is a very sharp, motivated, interested group. We can't do it, but they're not able to do everything. So I think part of the conversation too is, you know, if you're going to prioritize something in the assist or preserve category, what would you prioritize? And I, I've heard a lot about home ownership. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I would prioritize identifying the different groups that you're trying to assist, mm -hmm. and then. Focusing on the different programs that would help those groups. So, like, what are your thoughts? That's kind of where I started. So, that's kind of based on the study, then thinking of the 30% and below. Yeah, it's on the 80% and higher. And so, then mm -hmm. from there, you put the 80% and higher, you've got, if they're making 80 to 140% of AMI, they potentially have solid jobs, decent credit scores, they're going to apply for a loan mm -hmm. and get that down payment assistance. And then the lower income would be focusing on affordable housing, inclusionary zoning, creating those units that are available to them. And Jake, what do you think? What well, I, I don't know. I think especially, I mean, just from my experience, um, I, I, I feel like 80 is a little high for that entry. Um, just, just because, I mean, like us, we're, you know, uh, we're raising little kids and we both work and it's really hard and my, my mm -hmm. wife works like 24 hours a week um i work 40 hours a week and i just barely got time to like eat ourselves you know it's just, right. i i just i wouldn't uh i i yeah i feel like maybe 80s 80s a little a little steep I, I guess just for that but um well that goes to the point that i want to say kevin made kind of a long time ago when we talked about AMIs, is that we do a, a Denver metropolitan fiscal area AMI. It's kind of why our AMIs are so high. Do we look at the actual population of Inglewood and we talk about AMIs for Inglewood only programs? It couldn't be for state and it couldn't be for federal. 
do we create different AIs? Yeah, yeah, yeah because sorry. I think we I talked about AB. I mean, that's right. right. If you look at our, our game from compared to Rapsville County, we're yes. far below that. But, um, I do think that makes sense. Because even with Prop 123, we had a hard time finding a comparable mm -hmm. demographic way to go to like Adams County because of the income of Inglewood not being so similar to the neighbors. That makes sense. I mean, again, we couldn't do it for anything state or federal, but a lot of the things we talked about have been things that we would do at the city level. Mm -hmm. We can create our own city AMIs, or we can call them AMIs, they're our own like, income threshold just to where we. Mm -hmm. What groups we want to focus on? I mean, and just that eighty percent number just comes from that policy study, right? right. The biggest need, so that's why I was. In, in that way, they're going to use uh -huh. several like AMI because yeah. it's something well, that I, is. <laughs> I have that sheet literally on my desk next to my computer because we're talking about AMI so much for all the programs I do, and I'm constantly looking at it like it's a really important sheet. I but Google it, it every time, but I. <laughs> Go out there, but you got to have an extra gap, but it doesn't have to be that way. Thank God, because I think that's something else to think about too. Is we can look at our own uniqueness and figure out what what our what our income thresholds really are. We what could be that, and that could be that person's job. That's a great shot. Why that person? <laughs> yeah, I just I, yeah, I guess I, I do think. Um, I do job description. Yeah. I do think. I do think. Uh, I do think it's good for. For the community and good for society and stuff to have, have um, you know, uh, young families and have little kids going to the English schools and all that kind of stuff. I, I just, they do know it's uh, if you're really in Catholic that when it, when it comes to just just earning potential and stuff. I don't. Know. I mean, I, I think so. Anyway, it's just you know, your 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 expenses are high and you've got a household of two potential earners. At least one of them probably is. A, isn't um, working full time, you know? mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah, and can't can't devote a lot of time to like career building or mm -hmm. or uh, or getting higher degrees or, or whatever. If you're kind of consumed with your children, yeah. you make all of that work. And I yeah, I, mean, I am thinking back to like like our our, our situation. You know, one of those was that we were willing to uh, sell for 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 an old, just naturally cheap. House relatively. With it's wonderful cool. character, though. Let's not yes, it's, 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 it's <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's a fixer up here, and, and you know, I'm kind of handy enough to put some a lot of work into it. But, um, but I'm, I'm just thinking of other other people in those that in that boat. And yeah, I, I guess um, I, I just want to wonder what what we could do to kind of facilitate that. And, and in in our own case, um, our situation was sort of. Yeah, we we were we were happy with a with a small house, an old house that was kind of a fixer upper, and then mm -hmm. uh, we had to get help from my father in law to pay for the down payment, which is mm -hmm. obviously not uh, available to everybody. So I just right. wonder, um, I wonder how the what what the city what the city can do for for someone in in a parallel universe where I don't have that father in law, they can the, right. the father in law. You know, I, I wonder what the city could do for for someone in, in a similar position, other than just somehow. Having money to check. So. And what I'm also hearing you too is maybe how important it is once you're in a home to be in and out. I know the city does have a couple of programs to you know help homeowners do big things and stuff. Um, but we don't have a lot of funds for like mortgage assistance if we fall behind for a month or things like that. So maybe it's even thinking about how do we assist families who are in those starter homes and who kind of are maybe just got in and just made it stay. Right, mm -hmm. and make and keep those homes viable because, as you said, it, it builds the community. We get our kids in the schools and retention, right? Like, like, yeah, retention of folks who want to stay in their homes as the market changes, the rate changes, property or health insurance right. increase, insurance increase. Like, what else can we do? I mean, that to me, that, that's kind of preservation of the current, you know, home ownership mm -hmm. pool that we have, the community mm -hmm. that we have, absolutely. You know, another thing that Clarice Fortunato talked about in our um, housing or our English Chamber of Commerce board meeting last time, um, they were doing a school drive, school school drive, and 66% um, of the kids in the English public schools all qualify for free subsidy function, so they're mm -hmm. at a little poverty level. And so when you're looking at like such a large portion of 
the school likely that renter population because right. that is what we're seeing in the school uh, people are moving and there's not a lot of stability in school so what can we do to help that group become invested in the community like since mm -hmm. their kids are in the schools like how can we help those renters become homeowners when they're at or below that level right like those are the people in the school renting the houses in our neighborhoods from the second homeowners that moved out and then went to their friends. <laughs> Up to my boss, I got like at least five houses on my block or rent they're long term renters. Right. And so they're forever. Right. I don't think it's like wrong with long term renters, but yeah. it's interesting to think that the city has so many renters. Mm -hmm. What's the thing? Like it's not we've seen those houses turn over a few times and yeah, I've seen houses on the block side. Mm -hmm. So is, is there a way to do the um how would the uh how would the city go about <clears throat> having like a bunch of properties that have deed restrictions on them? Uh, that's the kind of thing you would need to mandate from the that'd be a land and trust situation that would be like a, a what do you call it a habitat or ECLT coming in and putting it in the the city could also do it themselves. Because they, they can do the restrictions? Okay. Yeah. That, that's what. That, that's what. But someone has to manage it. And yeah. I mean, the city of Denver did a bunch of deep restricted homes. What was it in Green Valley, right? Oh, right, right. Yeah. And the, then they Denver weren't paying attention. Yeah. Well, it was the Denver housing, it was actually the city. Okay. And um, they weren't paying attention. People were selling these houses and they weren't catching the deep restricted and they were selling for hire. Like, you have to have somebody on. Mm -hmm. So it can be a city, it can be a different entity. Mm -hmm. But it does. But that's, but that's a way to keep the home support. Because that, that's what I think. But yeah, there's a couple of families on my block too where mm -hmm. they're they, they yeah. have kids and they they're renting a little house and they've been renting it forever. And mm -hmm. yeah, and they feel like uh probably the only only avenue to, to home ownership or some of that would be some kind of right. or or yeah, or or or, or, or some kind of deep restrict. Yeah. Just, just something that somehow is, mm -hmm. is well below market. I mean, yeah, like when the ECLT went in and bought a mobile home park in Durango because an investor was trying to come in and they basically created a deed restriction so that they could keep their property without it becoming a rental for them because somebody who bought the land out from under them. And so that's just. And so how, how did they, they just purchased it? They purchased it, but they let the homeowners become um, like co op homeowners on the property with them. So they, it was a. A co op purchase, and they purchased it and then they sold it to them as a deed restricted. But they already owned it, so I don't know. We don't have a We don't figure out the how. But it was a big deal. It was a really big win because this is a huge investment target for investors and local homeowners. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, we don't have a lot of them, but very <laughs> important. Really no, but I think we have a lot of, you know, with Jacob's up, these great little starter homes that maybe are older or whatnot, but um, are, are good entry level and they're not going for entry level prices. Like, how do we market correct that? Or should we market correct that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Come on. Yeah. Can you preserve those under a deep restricted? Right. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. I just wonder how you could, how you could, um, because yeah, I, I you know I was looking at some of the like street view of some of the and, and Zillow you know records on Zillow and stuff. So mm -hmm. some of the newer um, buildings that have gone up on like Corona and stuff and Hampton and, mm -hmm. and, and Ogden and stuff. And, and and yeah, there there would be some some little old like fixer upper for four hundred that got torn down and replaced by units that are like one point two million trees. I, I yeah, how how do you hey. How, what, what, what is the solution that I, you know, I, I don't really know. You don't have to know, but if that's a, you know, if that's a priority for the group, right? If the group decides that, you know, we want to to save these, we want to make sure we have this opportunity, you can let them the employee that we're hiring figure out the house. Yeah. And let's be able to talk about that. I and wonder if there's something um, analogous to like, you know, historical preservation or something where, where maybe the city can identify these things. Mm -hmm. Put some kind of restriction on. I don't know. Right. Maybe well, it's maybe not a historical preservation because we're not preserving it for right. the history. We're preserving it for the 
Affordability. Yeah. Yeah. So preservation. Um, I, 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 yeah, I do feel like the, yeah, I do feel like like maybe the 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 keeping R one zoning, but but allowing some of those, um, yeah, cottage zoning or stuff might might be a decent middle ground. You know. Mm -hmm. I'm curious too, like I would love to talk to some of the other chambers of commerce in these cities where they've imposed commercial linkage fees to see how it can affect the business mm -hmm. retention or um, recruitment. What, what is that exactly? So basically the businesses have to pay a, a linkage fee for affordable housing. They they impose it only on commercial properties in Denver and in Longmont. Um, so the businesses are paying an extra tax for affordable housing. And so that's just something they paid regularly. Also. Yeah, it's something that got added to their. I think twenty fifteen was the the Denver one. Um, yeah, so it's just something that got added to their tax bill, essentially. So they're commercial landlords. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, like, if we did that in Inglewood, would people leave if we implemented mm -hmm. just a commercial pitch fee? You know, that'd be a, a question for the downtown. Well, they're the all going to say yes. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the landowners will, yeah, it's not wildly, you know, yeah. I don't know. I'm just wondering how it's affected their business, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, environment. But I want, it's interesting to think about that because, um, you know, some of the folks who have small businesses talk about, you know, they can't understand my people because there isn't enough affordable house before they're starting to live. So if there was some sort of kind of commercial linkage, we would that go into workforce housing? Workforce housing? Like maybe that's now what funds are thirty percent in my below folks. That's the same. Thirty percent to you. usually workforce is like eighty to one twenty for renting. For renting, really? I thought it was easy. Workforce is normally like conserved eighty to one twenty because it's like our teachers. But again, and I um, maybe we really revisit this idea of creating different AMIs for Inglewood, right? Like what does it look like to be an Inglewood teacher? What really is your salary? Yeah. And, and, there's probably not really 80% AMI of the city. I mean, we have an Inglewood teacher on our on our staff, and she, you know, one of the yeah. things about this Inglewood down payment assistance is she doesn't live in Inglewood right now. So how could she qualify for it to buy in Inglewood when she works in Inglewood? But well, they don't have, like, that either you live or work in Inglewood. Well, I don't know. Like, okay. I haven't yeah. attached anything to that, but that was what kind of a question. It's like, would this apply for me too? Yeah, that would be kind of rough if you got priced out and you couldn't get back in because you didn't qualify. Or yeah, but right. you're, you're not a resident now, so you don't have to be a resident. Yeah. Well, like, that's I think a good question that I think the group is going to have to tackle here soon. It's like the who. We talk about Inglewood. What does that mean? Does that mean people who have born and raised or who lived here for five years, or he's worked here for five years? What are the things that housing never does and so it's out there for like food for thought? Um, is when we have we have certain programs that we are trying to target our community. We're trying to target Inglewood, we're trying to target Sheridan, we're trying to get folks in that community to get the rental assistance they need so they can stay. Mm -hmm. And our threshold is live or work. So that folks who are maybe like a teacher or a teacher's aide or like a CNA or something at that one of the hospitals could qualify, you know, they live in they live in work. Mm -hmm. They have to then move here to get the assistance, but then now they're live or play, mm -hmm. right? And they're not commuting, they're reducing the cost for that, the time for that. So that's something I think the group is going to have to think about. So we've talked a lot about Inglewood. We have to find what it means to help an Inglewood person. Mm -hmm. The land trust that I work with does, um, for our Rhino property, they have like a ranking system. Like it is. DEI program basically, mm -hmm. where they rank people based on your connection to the neighborhood, whether you live there now, grew up there, went to okay. school there. Um, yeah. But it does take developing a system and ranking each applicant individually, you know, it's or running, I don't know that they actually have a program set up, they're just a small team, but it, it takes manpower and it takes. We're hiring somebody. Yeah, it's the job description. <laughs> but but seriously, we have lots of conversations in the big group about like what does it mean? And is it a ranking system of how long you've lived here? Is it how long you've worked? Is it yeah? Or you get a point for each of those things, you know, and right. the highest point gets that loan first. Yeah, I know that we're we're really lucky in that we're we're living, uh, me and my wife are, are living very near our um, extended families and stuff. And we all I mean my parents would be in a way worse position if you know, my brother didn't too. 
here. Right. Right. We, we grew up in, in Englewood. And you I, get all the points. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, not all. Um, but uh, my, my, my point being, I, I do think they're, that's good for, I mean, uh, for the senior evening. Yeah, it reduces, reduces mm -hmm. the burden on society or whatever. When, when, big fam when families can stick together, mm -hmm. I, mean, okay. it, 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 I think that solves a lot of a lot of problems of child care. It solves a lot of problems with, with uh, mm -hmm. people trying to age in place. Those are yeah, yeah. Those are yeah. Yeah. So I think that's just. I mean, we've got. I've got to play some of the notes or just like general questions, and I kind of put that in there because we. We dabbled with it a little bit, mm -hmm. and in our conversation here, we've talked about we'll do this ring the wood and this ring the wood. Who, who, who was in Well, I mean, I think that's back to the the first thing that they said with assist. Like, who are we trying to assist? Like, what are the groups? Mm -hmm. And then what are the programs to assist them? And then you're saying like, who qualifies for those groups? Right. You know, because um, you talk about you're basically kind of an Ingle wood native came back and. Lived, came back, or yeah. but you're pretty dang close, right? Um, <laughs> when you said my husband's in England, I was born in Indianapolis, it's the better, yeah, right. And but you have ties, like you clearly were like, I'm gonna come back to England, my family's here, um, and let's see. or less than, but what about like a, a new person who's like, Oh, I need to be here, I'm loving the wood. Is that person mm -hmm. less if they're going to be invested? We well, have volunteer hours to something to get points. Yeah, I don't know. Right. Yeah. That's the service. service. Well, <laughs> somebody who was it? Joy Joy. I can't remember who was in one of our earlier meetings. Uh, was telling like an anecdote about, about their their growing up or something where um, <clears throat> where you know like my I think I, I think she was saying like my mom was was um, raising us you know single mom and everything. And, and was applying everywhere for for any kind of housing. It's like, right. yeah, that's that's really important. Obviously, you don't you don't like, oh, you're not hanging with the doctor. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's just inconvenient. Yeah. So yeah. And that, so so that that anecdotes you know stuck with me because I, I think it was because um because another task force member was saying the thing. Yeah, something about like yeah. I, I don't know. So 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 that that stuck with me. The anecdote about like yeah, my mom was just applying everywhere to just get us into right. halfway decent housing. I thought that was. Could we, could we want, how do we want to gate them? Do we want to gate keeping the water? Do we not want to? Right. Yeah. You know, the thing is, rent to, I mean, the renting habituates this instability and the need to move and the need to constantly keep your rent at a certain level and adjust. Yeah. And so you're almost punishing people for the hardship of having right. to move. So, yeah. I mean, I do think. I do think there's an incentivization for like the people who work or currently live here as a priority on that list, but I think it might maybe could be open to everybody in any funds that aren't prioritized for those two groups um, currently renting or currently working in the community where their kids are in school or, yeah. you know, so, yeah, I think it's, it's that, that group first and then anybody else can apply. Well, maybe, you know what I think is maybe, maybe the, the, um, the preventing displacement thing should be more in the sort of home ownership side of things, and maybe the okay. the hiring of us, you know, mm -hmm. should, should be more of the focus on on keeping people from having to move far away from their right. parents or whatever who live in here with, or, or or move their kids out of the school district or whatever. Right. Because we've also in other pieces of the research, I've seen when kids have to bounce around from school districts, that's not good for the education also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's not necessarily bad, but you know what I mean? It was, it was yeah. tricky. Like, I, you know, you learn play in band and then you go to new school and the band's not good, so then you go to, you know, you never have any consistency. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I remember well, back before I had kids, I think this was back in 2017 or no, I think it was 2016. Me and my wife were looking at a rental. This was before COVID, but the rental market was still like horribly, horribly, miserably competitive. And uh, mm -hmm. we toured this fourplex, and it was me and my now wife, and then three other people. And this one woman just started going, like, Oh, God, this is, you know, this is in Clayton's catchment or whatever. My little boy, he goes to Clayton. I, yeah. I really need this. And like, felt really bad. I, then I felt bad for even being there. Are you looking at it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I just felt well because she was just so panicked about about trying to trying to keep her 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 son at Clayton mm -hmm. and like now that I have kids at Clayton, like yeah, I would hate to have to pay for their school. Right. Yeah, and I mean I don't know if she was necessarily like 
raised here or not, but I feel like if, if there was some point system like that, I don't already want points. If you're, right. like the alternative is that your kid gets ripped away from the points for stability, like this would yeah. be the stability. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that could be really right. Fun. Like, what are the priorities of the program? Like, is it to stabilize people? Is it to I think that's like a really good question. Like, yeah, what are the priorities? Like, yeah. are we trying to create stability for the people who live here or attract more residents? Or... Yeah, I feel like maintaining the ties that people have already made. So, the, mm -hmm. the tie of a child to his school is very important. Also, I think the tie of people to their uh, parents or their kids' grandparents is also really important. You know, I mean, when, when I think about the most important, the, the things, the most important things about being where I am right now, it's it's about my kids and their friends and their schools and uh, being close to their grandparents and their cousins. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Well, I definitely think with this increasing aging population becoming the next major population in England, that's a huge factor that needs to be considered as aging in place and how do we help people age in place and how do you close and creating the community. And is that like we create a family fourplex and mm -hmm. grandma and grandpa can live here and or a little cottage. It's, it's cottage house in the back. They stay in your building. Right? Like, 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 it's a little like, bit too close now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would be for my parents. Okay. Although the baby you and your yard. Yeah, we'll just at least have one over. All right. I'll push it. Yeah. It's in your house. Yeah. My mom can stay there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're up, just about six o'clock. We have a little like six or teen ish, but I know we've all. We've all talked about our kids and our families. They know we all have places to go. Um, and they do really appreciate your time and meeting in person. Anything else you want me to capture? I've got a lot of notes. My goal is to kind of clean these up for you guys and put them in some categories so that whoever decides to present, you can paper, rock, scissors, or barter money, or who knows. Um, so you have something kind of leg not legible, but more organized. I just did a lot of random note taking and tried to put things. I will do a better job of cleaning those up for you guys. But any last thing you want me to capture before we go home to our homes and our families and get started? Yeah. Yeah, I think Grace did too. With some really amazing ideas. I hope I uh, did a decent, I don't know. I, I feel like I kept kind of my mind kept veering off the whole reserve thing that I signed up for. <laughs> I, I, I hope I. Uh, Contributed some of that. No, I think you did. I think it was really some of the ownership preservation things I thought was really. Yeah, yeah. I feel like the well, I yeah, I, I feel like the preservation piece is is probably why the original code next kind of blew up, and, mm -hmm. and I so I feel like that I, that yeah. I also feel like it's it's kind of the hardest hardest question to answer or the hardest thing to answer. Mm -hmm. I think of those four groups that we had, you know, kind of. Because preservation really means we we stop the market. Yeah. Right. And that's what I think could, could be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if there's a I think preservation is really gonna come down to partnerships. Partnerships with the land trust, partnership mm -hmm. with habitat, partnerships with nonprofit, right? The housing authority, just anything to get those subsidies and incentives and tax breaks. Um <laughs> right. Nobody's going to build affordable housing without the subsidy. And in this market, right? Yeah. Like, they think that you want to Yeah. For the new uh, look at my parents are right now in Wisconsin. Like, oh, so affordable there. That's uh, yeah. affordable for their, their cost of their, their income. Right. And, and this is a different place. Like, you're reading. Dollars. I was reading so about a couple of those perfect. books from California yeah. to Missouri, and they're, they're, it was in the New York Times or something about their cost of living. Um, and how different it went down, like mm -hmm. their insurance, their food costs, their gas costs. Yeah. But then it's like when you compare their income, the average income. It's still, yeah. I mean, it wasn't yeah. as bad. Yeah. yeah. It was still yeah. better than in California's prices, but it was, it's all relative. And really. you pay a premium for a gorgeous state. Yeah. You know, and then a really awesome city that's really close to a lot of cool amenities. Like, we wouldn't have some of these if we didn't live in a place that was desirable. And so at the end of the day, we're lucky. Yeah. To have yeah. Gas. And how do we preserve and assist that? And do all yeah, this. Exactly. and we are thinking it's like fought just south of the metro too, where we're you know Douglas County is fighting back, Denver's pushing people out. We're kind of becoming this like mm -hmm. catch all, and we have to absorb it because we can't push it anywhere else. We have to tackle this problem instead of just being like, oh. <laughs> and that goes into the keep moving. And that goes into who is Ingle and what is Ingle and when we think about all things. It's like it's, it's a heavy topic. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and so as you continue to think, you know, let me know. Um, again, I'm gonna get those notes together and send them out to you guys probably early next week. And at that point, too, you know, we can kind of share the document and we can add things if something that didn't come up. If you have that burning three a.m. thought that wakes you up, like let's add it back in. This is not the only time. Yeah. Um, and again, this is the first round, yeah. right? You guys will present on the third, and then we have a couple more uh, times to do iterations. I don't know what we'll need as a small group again. We haven't gotten that far as a design team. You don't think we need to do a second time? Um, I don't think so because I think I'm not hundred percent sure. We're trying to adapt like the uh, facilitation strategy and the recommendation strategy to the group and how we start to go. So we maybe might need to meet again in November, but it wouldn't be before the next meeting. Um, but I believe all those recommendations on the next meeting are going to start to make like one big document that we're going to start as a group, we're going to start getting to that and consensus and, and doing some of that really difficult work of do we agree enough on these things? Do we not agree enough on these things? What exactly are we presenting at the next meeting? You're going to present kind of your recommendations. Okay. So I've got them all over the place. So I'm going to, I'm going to put them together, make some more themes, um, and probably create a document that's that's like a theme or two with a couple recommendations under under the big umbrella of a system preserve. So I feel like we've got a system preserve and we've got some other things underneath and some recommendations under like this. Do you so want to do like a system and a preserve and we'll both present? I mean, you guys can do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're both good nice. at talking at the group and that. Yeah, the str struggle, I'm, the struggle I'm having lately is uh, I'm just having a lot of trouble. Uh, Finding the time for the for the task force. Um, right. Uh, so, so I, I don't know. I mean, if if it's the kind of thing that would involve a fair amount of preparation, um, that could be hard for. I I, I could show up unprepared. I feel like I show up unprepared a lot. Right. Because because I, I just really struggle to find find the time to. The task uh, force has asked a lot of you guys. That you know, twelve months of uh, this of the work and then yeah. work. So my goal was to try to have a document that even if you didn't get a chance to read until five minutes before, yeah. you feel comfortable still talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Everything you've already yeah. So, so I'm I'm fine with um I don't have a problem with pre pre presenting um uh, other than um just if, yeah if, if it's something that required a fair amount of like preparation at home. No, we're gonna we do it all here. I'll okay. make it all look pretty and easily readable and have it to you guys in enough time. So that I think it's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think because I have your email address from here. Yeah, yeah I, I think maybe the you can make a game time. Well, and yeah. I also like, I mean, I think that your input has been very valuable. So I don't think that you're unprepared. I think you've got some yeah. insight. But I think that also like this is what I'm doing for my career. So I don't want you to feel like you're not doing enough. Like I'm literally sitting and reading this stuff all day. Yeah, yeah. So I think like, Comparatively, I do think what you're bringing is as much as anybody else is bringing. Like you are on the task force, yeah, you know, as a resident, obviously, too, but also as like a real estate. That's what I was the, the industry. Like, the, yeah. Yeah, the industry. <laughs> yeah. Like you're real industry people, so it's not anything to you with us. Yeah, I don't want you to feel like you want to like, I didn't feel that. Like, um, no. I'm, I'm in one of the. I'm the, really keeping your chunk of affordable housing development for this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm in one of the just some guy slots. You one of the really valuable residents yeah. who give us. Yeah. I mean, I as I ask for a person, I tend to get like kind of like this, right? So I have learned so much from all the just residents on the task force to think about what can the housing authority do different aside from the task force, aside from what anybody recommend that recommend, and it's helped me go like this. Yeah, yeah. So having them on the task force has been so valuable. Well, I would be interested in, in the idea of splitting up into assist and preserve, and then each. Okay. Let me sure, yeah. start to the document that way. Okay. I'm going to take it from there. Okay. Okay, cool. That's one of the, you know, in the last place that I wish okay. that more task force members were here because I felt like that opposing view, the people. Yeah, were, we've missed our opposing view. Yeah, yeah. the opinion yeah. wasn't there while we were forming opinions. Yeah. And so I was really like, oh, I wish is that valuable to me too. Yeah. I learned a lot from the opposing yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, I, it's like their input. And, yeah. And, and it's actually made me think that as a housing authority, I at some point should convene some more residents feedback, but just general yeah. city and single resident feedback and announce yeah. my housing friends. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because we're here to serve a bigger mission and sometimes that gets lost. In, and you're supporting uh, the building of housing in these communities too. Mm -hmm. and like, you know, 
We're providing tax incentives for the developers building in their new right. So being just a guy has been very helpful. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Okay, 607. I think we're we officially adjourned and we can stop. Right. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh,